Welcome to our episode of Biblical Archaeology, From the Ground Down. Presented by Bible Interact and hosted by Dr. George Sparks. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of the Bible from leading experts in the field of archaeology. Pergamum is one of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. It states, I know where Satan's throne is, however, the debate is what constitutes Satan's throne in Pergamum and what sets it apart from other cities to deserve this title given by the Apostle John. Pergamum was certainly the center of many temples including Trajan, Athena, Dionysus and Zeus. Not to mention the Aslepian on the lower tell that served as a medical center and spa. This is what it would have looked like in this reconstruction. Notice the distinctive round treatment enter or hospital and the Zeus Asclepios temple beside it. Over the door of the hospital was a sign that read death is not allowed. The snake symbol on modern medical crests come from the snake associated with Asclepius noted on coins and pillar carving from Pergamum. The great altar of Zeus is long gone, but its legacy remains and some suggest it is the throne of Satan. Although the structure that surrounded it is no longer around, it can still be seen in the Pergamum Museum of Berlin. Two trees mark the location of the sacred altar, a reminder of the ancient place of worship. The question remains what was it about the altar of Zeus that set it apart from other cities who had one as well. Pergamum was famous for the worship of the imperial cult as celebrated in Rome. The Trajanium in Pergamum was built of white marble and was started in the first century under the Roman Emperor Trajan but later enlarged and completed under Hadrian. Colossal statues of both emperors have been discovered in the ruins along with a statue of Zeus, who was also worshipped here. The temple extended 223 by 190 feet with nine Corinthian columns on the two longer sides and six Corinthian columns on the two shorter sides. It has been noted that it was the most splendid monument erected to Trajan anywhere in Asia. While some or all of these elements were present in other cities, it was the sheer scale and concentration of them here at Pergamum that justified John in identifying this place as Satan's throne, the very place where Satan lived. While the proconsul carried the right of the sword known in Latin as the Ius Gladi, Christ wields the sharp two-edged sword of authority and would fight against them with the sword of his mouth if they did not repent. The suzerain knew that, from a Christian perspective, Pergamum was a concentrated center of demonic activity, and it was this activity that elicited John's harsh comment. Christ praises their faithfulness to his name, faithfulness despite the martyrdom of Antipas, but rebukes them for allowing in false teachers who compromise with the current culture. A messianic banquet awaits the overcomers. All our books are listed on our website smyrnaean.blogspot.com and can be found on amazon.com. Welcome back, people. Today we have with us Dr. David Graves, no stranger to the channel. We're going to be on the third city in his book, Jesus Speaks to the Seven Churches. I was talking to David Graves. I do one city at a time. I don't want to waste any time here. Dr. Graves, welcome. Tell us about that third city, will you please? Uh, good to be with you, George. John is referring back to the Roman emperors and the imperial cult. Now, Satan's throne has been identified in, in many different um, identifications in the city. Um, some have suggested that it was a the upper city itself, because when you look at it from the lower city, it looks like a a throne shape, the Acropolis. I mean, looks like the throne. Hemmer didn't think so. Colin Hemmer, um, he was a writer in the in Cambridge, and he has written a lot on the seven churches. He says it was just a scenic feature. Frisian said, another guy that wrote, he said that uh, it represents Satan's throne with a with a local hostilities toward the Pergamese. So there's been many, many theories about what the throne of Satan would be. Some suggest it's the judge's seat or throne. Uh, the New Testament also speaks of a seat of, of office or state of the judge in Matthew and in Luke. But most people have said that it was the altar of Zeus. Now, the altar of Zeus was a significant um, temple there in, uh, in Pergamum. It has since been um, deconstructed. It was removed during the Second World War 
by the Germans and taken back to Germany. And you can now see it in the Pergamum Museum. It's been beautifully reconstructed. Scholars debate whether they were accurate or not in, in how they reconstructed everything. Um, but that being aside, it's certainly a very monumental structure that it's, that originally sat on the top of the Acropolis at Pergamum, built by King Eumenes II of Greece in 170 BC. And it had an altar there, a golden altar, or compared to the golden altar in Revelation 8. All that remains today of it is actually two trees that uh, mark the location of the altar. The rest of it is, is now on display in the museum in Berlin, the Pergamum Museum. I'll show a photograph of that. It's pretty impressive. It needs to be remembered that this was one of the largest altars in antiquity. They had friezes around the bottom of it, epic battles of the giants, um, the Olympian gods, and smoke went up from it 24 hours a day. For seven days a week, the um, priests would alter, um, alternate, and they would sacrifice uh, on those altars. But it was not actually a closed-in altar. It was an open-air altar, so that smoke would rise from it every single day. Some have suggested that's the throne of Satan. I don't think so. I think it's more complicated and more um, developed than that. It had been excavated, of course, by the Germans. Um, when we come down to the lower tell, the lower city, we see that there's the Asclepian. And some have suggested that that is the Satan's throne. Now, this was a sanctuary of Asclepius. It offers two options for the alteration and to the allusion to the, to the um, throne of Satan. One is Christians' aversion to calling Greek, the Greek god of healing Asclepius. Um, he's known as God Savior, Theosatar or Zeus Asclepius. Um, that in itself would be an aversion to, to the Christians. The second allusion is the em, em, emblem of the serpent that we find connected with Asclepius. Both have led commentators to um, connect this to the throne of Satan. And in fact, today, one of the pillars still remains, but has a picture of a snake on the outside, uh, etched on the side of the uh, a portion of the pillar. Now, numerous cities had sanctuaries dedicated to the healing god Asclepius, as they also had uh, many temples dedicated to Zeus. The question is, what sets this city out different from all of the other cities to make it the throne of Satan? That is the important question to ask. This particular sanctuary in Pergamum um, for Asclepius was the largest sanctuary, or one of the largest sanctuaries in the ancient world. The largest was at Epidarius in Greece. But this became the model for the sanctuary at Pergamum that was built to Asclepius Sotar, or Savior. So this is very, this would be very um, offensive to Christians who were living there in Pergamum. So that is one option. When you look at it, I'll show you a reproduction of it, how it would have looked, would have looked like. It had a round building, very unique, interesting architecture. It was called a treatment center or a hospital. And beside it was another round building called the, the Zeus Asclepius Temple. Now, what's fascinating is that they had snakes that would uh, crawl around in the inside of the hospital and over the door was a um, a label saying death is not allowed. So basically, if you died, you had to be hauled outside of the hospital to die outside of the building because you couldn't die inside the hospital. <laughs> Very interesting wow. practice. That's one way to guarantee 100% success inside. There you go. <laughs> Got to make it work. It was really like a religious spa or healing center. And so it had a large stoa. These are column colonnades um, around the whole structure. There was a library, 
um, a porphalon, and the theater was on the edge of it. Had some latrines down in the other corner. There was an incubation complex where they would take you out of the hospital and you could recover there. But I found it interesting that snakes, because they worship, they worship the snake, were, were actually freely roaming in the hospital. You'd think they'd get in the way. You would think so. And uh, I've run into some poisonous snakes in uh, in Jordan. Um, they're there in Turkey as well. So they're nothing to, to play with. So certainly uh, if you're trying to recover, you don't want to run into a snake. It has been, of course, because of the snake connection and because of the uh, gods Asclepius, that has been considered the throne of Satan. It's interesting also that one of the most famous physicians came from Pergamum. His name is Galen, and we have uh, his writings, and he has become the foundation of Western medicine, but he's from that city. Also interesting is that when you look at all of the symbols, uh, medical symbols, of, a, of there's two wings, a staff, and a snake running around it, that actually comes from the worship the sanctuary of of Asclepius. The staff. Today it's the symbol of medicine today, the Caduceus, right? Yes. Doctor, doctors wear it, nurses wear it, or what have you, in the medical that's field. A, that's okay. right. That's right. And we have it on the coins. Uh, we have yes. it on the statues. We have it on the pillars. Um, so it, it comes from this, this root um, based in the, um, the cult of Asclepius. In the sanctuary there in Pergamum. Um, I'll show some photographs of those. Now, the next um, thing we should talk about is the imperial cult temples. And there were a number of them in Pergamum. Perhaps the most famous is the uh, the temple of, of Trajan. The Trajanum, as it is known as, um, was a very large white marble building it would have been a spectacular dedicated to the roman emperor trajan 98 to 117 a.d was enlarged by hadrian uh, there, there were several colossal uh, images of roman emperors as well as a statue of, of zeus there were no, there's nine rema remaining columns on one side and six on the other. So it's a really large building. It was the most splendor monument erected by Trajan anywhere in Asia. So you can just imagine uh, what this city looked like with all of these temples. And some have suggested that this is Satan's throne, the imperial cult. And so Pergamum had the privilege of becoming the near Koros um, that is the keepers of the temple for two imperial cults, and they would eventually have three. And so this was a an important center for the worship of the imperial cult, the worship of the emperors in the Roman Empire. The question is, though, what made Pergamum stand out as the throne of Satan? We have Zeus's temples in other cities. We have imperial cults in other cities. We have many of the similar features that we find in Pergamum found in other cities. The Romans believed this was a seat of special authority, Roman opposition to early Christianity. And so it's not any one feature, I think, and I believe, in Pergamum that can be identified as the throne of Satan. It's the combination of all of these things together that constitutes, I believe, the throne of Satan. It's the concentration of these satanic and ungodly ideas and features that the Christians would have had aversion to. All in that one location, it's the concentration yeah. of a Pergamum to justify John identifying this place, I believe, is th Satan's throne. And that's my view on it that I take in my commentary. It's the sheer scale and concentration. While a proconsul carried the right of the sword, Christ wields the sharp two-edged sword, as he mentions in the, in the message, 
of authority and would fight against them with the sword of his mouth if they did not repent. So that was a type of metaphor. It was a type of metaphor, and everybody that read that would understand the meaning of the two-edged sword that represented the Roman Empire, and then the suzerain or the king knew that from a Christian perspective, Pergamum was concentrating a concentrated center of demonic activity, and was this that activated the illicit um, John's harsh comments, calling it the throne of Satan. That's interesting. It is really interesting. The Romans had the authority, as they did with Jesus Pontius Pilate. Yes. They have somebody executed. Yes. And in Revelation, they're using that 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 law, that that judgment, and then they're turning it around and saying, well, Christ has this authority overall. That's right. And that's yeah, that's and that kind of is cool because it, it puts us in the mind of the people at that time. Yes. That is neat. That we, is neat. We always have to understand what the message meant to the people living in the first century, to the people living there. And when we realize what it meant to them, then we can apply it to ourselves in our own culture and our own situation, uh, living under our own, um, if you will, oppressive governments, uh, oppressive culture, um, and how we contrast it with that. But we need to always remember that Christ wields the sharp two-edged sword, he has the authority, and he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, just a moment. This is also going to be on God's Learning Channel. So we're going to have pastors watching this. This last one is a good, good sermon material, I think. They can pull oh. a lot of sermons out of this room, really good ones. Every every city has great learning material and, and preaching yeah. material for it. So um I I encourage every the all the pastors to check in with all of the different cities and you'll find faith lessons in every one of them that you could use and apply in your uh, in your sermons as you preach to your own folks in, in the 21st century. Right. Even though this is biblical archaeology, we, we go ahead and <laughs> we share our content. Great. Well, it's important to connect, you know, the archaeology with the cultural context, uh, with the with the scriptural text, and then to make application for us today. That's a lot of really good information. And I could just imagine just one individual going into a city and how overwhelming it would be to bring about or to proclaim a faith when you have so much opposition and you look at the buildings and all the people and then of course uh the uh your god of healing you said it was asclepius yeah and um and george remember that every uh, everyone had to bring an offering a sacrifice an offering to the imperial cult they didn't care if you went down to the temple of zeus and you did your thing down there uh, but they required everyone with a with a, a libelous, it's a, a piece of paper, parchment, that said that I have sacrificed to the Roman Empire, to the Roman Emperor. So Christians wouldn't do that. And so they, they faced fierce persecution in the first century because of their, imagine. yeah. And so you can just imagine with so many temples in this city, being a Christian living there, what it would have been like. You know, the Roman cities really didn't have walls around them because they felt like Roman was so Rome was so powerful. We don't need walls. We have our military. Is that is that true? Yeah. Well, pretty much, um, most of these cities were surrounded by the Roman Empire, so it was it was controlled by the Roman soldiers that would were living in the region, protecting it. So you had free access on the roads. Uh, Roman mile markers telling you where the next city was. Uh, you had Roman fortifications protecting the water, uh, protecting things of importance, the travel routes. Uh, there was normally a Roman, um, a little Roman hut or or building 
every Roman mile where you could stay, um, wow. protect you on the Roman road. Um, and they would give you protection as you traveled. Um, so it was a happening place. They had some skirmishes, of course, in the German Germanic areas um, and in sort of the outlying areas. But um, Anatolia, here to modern day Turkey, was controlled by the Romans, a very safe place. And so it's many the idea of the, what is called the, the Pax Romanus, Roman peace. Yes. What is the statement of the Pax Romanus? Peace to Rome meant quiet to the province. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they uh, yeah. they lived in, in relative peace and tranquility. Um, they kept everybody happy, of course, with their theaters, with their performances. The Romans wanted to keep everybody, um, and they had their spa. Uh, they had their uh, um, Roman bath. So everybody was 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 kept entertained and kept uh, protected. Well, you know, it's interesting, that picture behind you, and it looks like it's it's at a higher level, right? Yes. I, I don't know. I, I was, I'm never, I, I've never been there. Okay. So I can imagine that you go to the, the city and, uh, and they got all these conveniences. Look at that theater. That'd be a fantastic view even today. Um, uh, and you can stand at the bottom of that and you can hear anyone whispering on the top seats. Wait a minute. <laughs> you can hear somebody at the top seats whispering? Well, if you as an actor, you'd be ticked. It's like, hey, you. <laughs> well, I actually get it reversed. You can hear somebody okay. whispering down at the bottom as they're performing up in the oh, seats. Okay. Yeah, I had it, I had it backwards. Um, right. it's, it's beautiful, the acoustics. And that's up in the Acropolis. That's where like uh, four or five of the temples were. And I've walked from that top location down to the lower city. Uh, it's quite a hike. And so we had a, uh, you know, a very large city that was in two different locations. So you would, uh, you know, do your sacrifices in the morning up on the upper tell. You'd walk down and go to the hospital in the afternoon to the spa and get uh, a good massage, um, you know, walk among the snakes, you know, get a few herbs, and then go home. <laughs> hey, talking about jail, you mentioned the temples and the hospitals and the theaters, and what about prisons in the ancient world, you know? Well, what? I'm throwing you a side one here, a side curveball. Yes. Did well, they find ancient prisons? Interesting. Most of the time, what they would do is they would just um, um, take people and put them on an island somewhere. Some have suggested that Patmos, where Paul or where John was, was um, he was an exile on an island such as this. So in the ancient Near East, they didn't have a lot of prisons. There is the uh, prison in Rome, uh, where it is believed that Peter was, and... Um, they did a lot of house arrest. Um, they didn't have a lot of infrastructure for it. So um, they would be exiled to an island where they couldn't escape. Uh, they were just taken away from society. Um, they had some prisons, but it was solitary confinement normally in waiting for your um, waiting for your execution. So it was either uh, recompense, you know, paid back to the community or death. So they didn't lock a lot of people up like we do and feed them and provide a lot of, uh, you know, infrastructure. You know, you couldn't watch t television 24 seven or, you know, all the luxuries I have in modern prisons today. Uh, in the ancient Near East, in the ancient world, that wasn't the, uh, the way it worked. It was either death or you get uh, put back into, uh, you know, your your civilization with uh, comp compensation. You had to pay okay. back something. I appreciate you being with us and explaining Pergamon and the uh, temples and what the, the use was for and the throne of Satan and how it is a concentration of everything going on there that would be cult cultic in nature. Um, so once again, doctor, I appreciate your time.
Thanks, George. Appreciate being with you today.